welcome to Omaha Beach. Uh, we're standing right now at the First Division Monument, and you'll hear us refer to this periodically. Uh, the reason the First Division Monument is here is because the sector behind us on the beach is where the First Division land is. Uh, First Division was one of two divisions that ultimately landed on Omaha Beach. As we're looking down at the beach, uh, from probably a kilometer and a half to your left, my right, down to these bluffs, kind of past the hill there, that was all the First Division sector. Okay, You've heard Big Red One, the term Big Red One, that's the nickname for the First Division. Then you had the 29th Division that landed on that side uh, of Omaha Beach. On D-Day, the 1st Division had more amphibious landing experience than any other division uh, in the United States Army. The 1st Division landed in North Africa, 1st Division landed in Sicily, and then the 1st Division landed here, right? The 29th Division, those guys had zero combat experience at all. So every single one of those guys that landed on Omaha Beach, that was their first time ever being in combat that particular day. Aside from the monument, you'll notice right over here, there is a uh, uh, bunker under the ground. And from here, all the way down to the beach, which we're gonna walk down there, there are a series and network of buckers, right? So back here, this was most likely an ammunition storage point that was, you know, further back from from the forward bunkers, which obviously were prone to naval attacks, to bombing, that sort of thing. And then you'll see other bunkers. Some are still in existence, some aren't. But you'll see other bunkers that are still out there. And basically, the officers would be in the bunkers further back. And then the guys up front, you know, on the front lines, they had the machine guns, they had the 88s, they had all those sorts of things uh, that would engage outward towards the invading force. But this whole network that you see of these bunkers and everything, that's what was referred to as the Atlantic Wall. You know, we talked about it last night. That was Hitler's great, vast defensive network that he built uh, to, to stop the Allies from invading. If you look out towards the water, now we're not even really overlooking the beach yet, but you'll notice that you can see a long ways in every single direction. We're about 120 feet, so 40 meters or so up from the beach here, which is what makes Omaha Beach unique from all of the other four landing beaches. It's the sheer elevation of the bluffs uh, here on the beach. <laughs> there are five draws on Omaha Beach, and a draw is an exit point to the beach, right? One of them is right here, and then there are five other draws, which we're going to go see a couple more uh, as the day goes on. But those draws were heavily, heavily uh, blockaded and uh, with lots of overwatching fire by the Germans because the Germans knew that the only way, I mean, you know, you're not going to bring tanks up these bluffs and these hills, so the only way to get off the beaches was to uh, u utilize these draws. So you'll hear on the U.S. side, you'll hear such things as Easy Red, Fox Green, you'll hear names like that, right? So those were objectives within the division objectives that basically broke the beach up and segmented the beach into about 10 different objectives, and each unit had one of those objectives. And those objectives were based and labeled on where the draws were at, if that makes sense. So uh, we're going to walk down and take your time. You know, there's, there's some steps, but could be a little slippery with the dew. We're going to walk down to the next monument, which is the, uh, a monument for the combat engineers. And the combat engineers were the first ones to land on the beach uh, with the first waves, because what's the job of an engineer to provide mobility for the infantry and to clear obstacles? Once we get down there, it's a great lookout point, and we'll talk about more specifically the defenses on the beach uh, and that sort of thing. Jeff, yes. When they were constructing all this, who did all the labor for... It's a good question. Yeah, so the uh, question was, uh, if you didn't hear Mark, uh, who did all the labor to construct all these things? Because there are millions and millions and millions of tons of concrete uh, in these bunkers, and the answer is primarily French. Uh, 
uh, locals. Uh, they, the Germans came in. Uh, in some cases, they employed the French, paid them a pittance uh, of a salary. In other cases, they forced them, uh, forced labor. But it was primarily the French, and that was their project every single day as they would come out, they would mix concrete. Starting in 1930. Uh, lightly, yes, but the, 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 the main part of this Atlantic Wall was built between 41 uh, and 43, and then obviously into 44. Uh, it, it, the, the discussion and the idea of the Atlantic Wall existed for a long time. Hitler talked about it. It was sort of like a, it was like a, um, a propaganda type of thing, you know, uh, where he was talking about this mighty wall and all those sorts of things. But the main construction of the wall was in the years leading up to, to, uh, to D-Day. He did it pretty quickly then. All the way. Yeah. And he, and he, and he briefed it, he briefed it, he briefed it as going all the way to Scandinavia. And, uh, uh, when, when Rommel took over the defenses of, of Normandy, uh, and, and the French coast, specifically the French coast, he took what was already there and said, that's not enough. Because remember, he believed that to win here, the Allies had to be pushed back into the water. Once the landing happened, it, we weren't going to be stopped. That was his philosophy. So his thing was, we need more, man. We need more concrete. We need more rebar. But every single one of these bunkers is designed and did prove to withstand the biggest bomb that the Allies had at that time. So every single bunker uh, was hit most likely at, at one point or another and they're still standing here today uh, so it shows you how much I mean you can see how much much concrete there was one last thing one last thing before we walk down there this terrain looked very different in 1944 you see trees you see uh, the, the big trees over there that's the Colville American Cemetery which we're gonna go visit uh, that's a very just an amazing place but as you're walking around, there was no greenery, there were no trees. The Germans came in and they burned everything. Why do you think they burned everything, Junior? Just to destroy it? No, they burned everything so they would have 100% unobstructed fields of fire down on the beach, right? Because remember, the, the, plan, the plan to build this Atlantic Wall wasn't just about the physical obstacles themselves, it's like, you know, Junior, when you went to basic and you started learning about tactics, it's, it's obstacles combined with interlocking fire, right? So the Germans said, we are going to put bullets and brass on every single inch of this beach. So in order to do that, they cleared everything. There were a few houses, they burned them down, they got rid of them. So every single thing that you see here was gone. And they had bunkers set up in layers, which we're going to go see some of those. Any other questions before we head down there? This big tunnel, they would have all joined. They would have all linked. That's correct. All the tunnels, yeah. A lot of the tunnels are blocked off now, or they've been filled in or whatever. All the way down. So that the officers... They were huge. That's right. So the uh, and feel free to walk down there, by the way. Yeah, yeah, but, check it out. but the officers, the officers would go up to the front lines, check with the guys, come back, and they would bring ammunition up. And it was it was all built so they didn't have to to surface yeah. if they were getting bombed or whatever. They could resupply all the guns, yeah. you know, because those eighty eight rounds are huge rounds, yeah, yeah. and they were constantly pushing to the front because the eighty eights that was the primary uh, weapon. I mean, the eighty eight was one of the finest, uh, you know anti-vehicle, anti-tank, anti-boat weapons that the Germans had. So that's what they were firing at all the vessels as the vessels this right, this arrived. Right, this would have all been covered. Every... Every instance all just been ships and shit. What at what point uh, do you reckon, oh, look at that. That's crazy, yeah. At what point, so the Germans are here, they've got their practice coming in. At what point on that morning, because it would have been dark, yeah. when did it get light enough that they were like, oh fuck? I'll show, I'll show you that when we go down because you can see it better from down there. I'll show that to you, and we'll we'll talk. They don't realize. I go no, no, no. The, it can't be true. The, it would have been like the, can't be true. The, the moment, the moment that you're like, oh shit, this is gonna be a really bad day. This is really bad. <laughs> This is good. This is not going to be a good day, and that's and that's important though to, to look at that perspective because people don't think about that. They just think, oh man, the 
there's poor soldiers that landed on the beach had this I, you know again as you just said you wake up and you see been sitting up that, for like months and months that, years. That, is that, is that, that, what is that out there is that there's one shit yeah the oh man there's another one let's start uh just walking down this way You can cut that off for now, Jane. Yeah, just re uh, when we get down here, just restart it. Yep. So I'm going to talk a little bit as we're walking here, but just focus more on the. Because I'm going to have to walk backwards. Uh, so just walk with me. Yeah, you're good. So we're walking down the hill from the First Division Monument to the engineer's monument. This particular area is not an overly frequented area. Uh, so when people come to Omaha Beach, most of the time they go further down the beach to where the big monument's at. And if you haven't seen the monument, we'll go to visit there later, but it's sort of a kind of big shiny monument. And it's, to, to be honest, to me, it looks a little bit out of place uh, for, for such a solemn uh, place. Like that monument to me looks appropriate, but this the monument that they call like the main Omaha Beach monument to me looks a little bit a little bit out of place. Why? Um, Why do you say that? Well, you'll see. You can make your own judgment. That's just my opinion. But it's it's shiny and modern looking, and uh, yeah, it's very modern looking, and nothing wrong with that. But it just it doesn't necessarily fit the other monuments in in uh, Normandy. Show them if you could, Victor. Look how the light is coming in on on the beach over there. Let's walk over here and look at that so they can see. That's crazy. I have never seen the light like that on the beach. One of the reasons we wanted to come in so early this morning, this is D-Day week, so lots of people come from all over the world. And so we wanted to try to get here before the crowds arrived. It's crazy, I've never seen that before. Trying to keep my back to the wind so you can so you can hear the microphone otherwise. Yeah. It's like this, just like this. That water? Yeah, that it's you can really see it once we get down here, but you can see how big these waves are, and that's very similar to what it was on D Day. So this monument uh, is dedicated to the 5th Engineers, and I'll wait for everybody to get down here. Ready. Unbelievably ready, yeah. So, t t they expected this, anticipated this for years. Now, as the invasion actually approached, they knew it was imminent. You know, they had sources that were out there that, that saw mass buildups of troops in, in, in England, and they had flyovers they would do, and they saw mass buildups of troops. So, they knew at the time we invaded that it was coming soon. They didn't know exactly when, but they knew it was coming soon. And so, uh, everybody was on a heightened state of alert, right? Uh, but the invasion, the Germans thought the invasion was going to be at Pas de Calais, which is the closest point between England and France. Yeah. And, and we had, we had a, um, uh, massive deception effort, which you probably read about or heard about where General Patton came in and he was seen in the media as going to Pas de Calais and he was seen as uh, building troops. We had fake vehicles, uh, like 
like uh, balloon type things that looked like tanks. Uh, we had all of these things that were uh, used in, uh, you know, across from Patakale to make the Germans think we were going to invade there. So they were ready for us, but the, their stoutest defenses were in Patakale, and their largest buildup of troops was there too. Now here at Omaha Beach, we underestimated the German defenses, meaning the Allies underestimated the German uh, defenses by half. So as it turned out, there was actually almost two divisions here on this one beach, two German divisions, and we thought there was one maximum, or possibly even two brigades at the time, what they called brigades. So, uh, a division at that time was, yeah, uh, uh, 12 to 14,000 men. Come this, come this way, we're gonna overlook. Okay, so we are, we're standing on a fighting position. So this is a German fighting position. And the name of this fighting position is WN62. Uh, WN it was just simply the German numbering system for the bunkers. Each bunker or each defensive position had two initials and then a number, right? So this one was, was WN62, and it consisted of the bunker down there and then the bunker that we're standing on. So as you look down at the beach, uh, from here you literally can see all of Omaha Beach. Those cliffs to your left, that is the network of cliffs that Point Du Hawk uh, was part of, which you heard so much about the rangers that scaled up the cliffs. That's right around the corner down that way. Uh, Further that direction, you can see faintly in the distance that the, the coast turns and then heads north, and that's Utah Beach way over in the distance, that direction. Of course, we're going to visit Utah Beach later on in the trip, but you can see, imagine all these trees being gone, any structure that you see over there being gone, you have completely unobstructed views of the entire beach. I wonder if saw the, you know, the black and white photos of this, why it was so black now, because this was all gone. All gone, burned. It was, it was all burned. So, also, as you look at the beach now, I would say the tide is, is uh, probably 70% up at this point. So, and we'll come back, and you'll see on the 6th when we come back, but at low tide, you had a approximately a kilometer of distance it would have to be covered from what they call the shingle to the water line okay kilometer normandy has the second largest tidal span in the world which means from low tide to high tide in, in florida for example from low tide to high tide it's what 10 meters 20 meters or something from low tide to high tide here in normandy it's about a kilometer wow so when you're standing there, like if the water, if the tide's behind you, within minutes, every wave that comes in is a foot or two feet or whatever, right? So you're looking at it at probably 70% in. When it's out, it is way, way out. Yeah. Because when you start seeing the waves breaking out there right now, that's where, yeah, that's exactly right. Water? It's all sand. It's all yep, sand. it's all sand, and you'll see it. You'll see it this trip and on and low tide. But uh, we talked about last night the two conditions that were required to land. So number one, junior, low tide. Low tide, right? The reason is if you were standing here on D Day, right, or that that time frame, and you looked out at the water, the tide's seventy percent in you would not see all the obstacles that were out there. They would be underwater, and that was by design, because Rommel thought, well, let's put these obstacle belts out there. We're gonna design them so when the tide comes in, they can't see them, so when the ships are coming in, they'll hit them, the troops will hit them, that sort of thing. So the Allies and Eisenhower said, we have to land at low tide, because we have to be able to see the obstacles and what we're dealing with. That's all fine and good for the ships coming in, but the poor guys that actually landed, a long way to go. had a kilometer literally that they were going to have to cover 
with completely, completely open fields of fire from the Germans, right? The second reason, the second reason that we needed to land at low tide was what, Junior? No, no, no. Why do else do we need to land at low tide oh. aside from the obstacles? Um, oh, because uh, it was easier for the boats to, to navigate. Yeah, so the landing craft, you're going to hear the term Higgins, right? Higgins boats, Higgins boats, Higgins boats. Higgins boats were a type of landing craft. As the invasion was being planned, one of the limitations that Eisenhower and all of the Allies had was how in the hell are we going to take 200,000 soldiers on one day and get them from these big Navy vessels to this beach here? Because you can't pull a battleship up here. You can't pull a destroyer up here. You can't pull a normal Navy ship up. So we had these big old things called LSTs, which stands for landing ship tank, right? Those were designed for amphibious landings. There's big metal boxes that had a ramp that would come down and bring tanks on the beach and those sorts of things. And we're going to talk more about those. But how to get the infantry guys from the boats to the beach? Well, there's a guy named Higgins, grew up in New Nebraska, in Nebraska, lived in New Orleans at the time, had a big company. He came forward and he said, guys, I have an idea. And so he knew some of the right people in the Defense Department. And they said, what's your idea? And he said, my company can mass produce these small landing vessels. They're going to be made of wood, but we can mass produce them. And we can use those to bring the guys in. So that's what they did. They, he produced 20,000 of these Higgins boats throughout the course of the war. And they were just big enough to fit a platoon size element. So about 36 soldiers. Uh, they were primarily made of wood, and then the ramp, which is what was facing the coast as these boats approached, the ramp was made of steel, right? It had a little peephole in it so that the soldiers could look through and see what was coming. But generally speaking, they were made of wood. They didn't go very fast, maybe like 8 or 10 knots, something like that. Uh, but the whole point was the big ships would carry the Higgins boats over, and then as they got close to the coast, they'd drop the Higgins boats, the soldiers would load up, and going ashore. So these poor guys were coming in, were coming in, and these boats were coming in. Well, these boats would have to drop off a group of soldiers and then turn around and go back and get more all day long. That was the plan. So if all of a sudden these vessels are coming in, and it's, let's say the tide's going out, and they beach themselves as they're pulling in, and they land on the, on the sand, what's going to happen? They're sitting ducks. You've got 88s that are sitting here focused in on all these guys, and they're sitting, really kind of sitting ducks anyway, but if you get stuck on the beach, you're done. You're dead. So now they can't go back out and get another. So with the rising tide, as I told you, it so quickly rises here. If they, if they were beached with the tide that was coming in, meaning we made a low tide, the tide's coming in, it would take a short period of time, and it would free the vessel, and they could get back out. So those are the two, two main reasons that we had to land at low tide. Let's go down now in the bunker, get out of this wind, uh, and we're going to go inside WN62. Just go to where Mike is at. Was it like this? It was it was obviously the wind. Under us. We're going to go in there. Which was like the wind. Of the, it was like that. what it was. Yes. The, 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 be careful here, yes. The conditions today are very, very similar to what it was on D-Day morning in terms of the weather. In terms of the weather. Be careful as you go down. Yeah, be careful here. I know. I have to go ahead. Yeah, you can thank the either the British or the US Navy for that. Uh, get out of the wind down here a little bit. Get out of your picture. Okay, so this is WN62, uh, and this was an 88 position. Who knows what uh, an 88 is? Junior, you know what an 88 is? Mark, do you know what an 88 is? Eighty-eight millimeter rounds, uh, which is a big old, big oh, yeah, about like that. 
about like that, probably that long. Uh, the Germans used the 88s. It was sort of a, like the perfect uh, weapon. They used it for direct fire and also indirect fire. Uh, so they used it for artillery type things and then also direct engagements. Uh, when we first entered the war, I mentioned last night that our tanks were not strong enough to, to stand up or to kill a German tank. Well, all of the German tanks were mounted with 88s. Uh, and so very powerful. U.S. soldiers are scared to death. Uh, Mr. Clanton will tell you all about he has nightmares about 88s to this day, uh, and he'll tell you about where he landed on Omaha Beach. There's an 88 position right there. So the 88s were set back further. So you had belts of obstacles on the beach, and there were five belts. Okay, so when low tide was down, there were five belts of obstacles. The first obstacles were geared towards knocking out the ships as the ships approached. So you'll see uh, they were basically, they were constructed different ways, but they're basically posts in the ground. Sometimes there were uh, X's, but there were posts in the ground that had mines, teller mines, and there were anti-tank mines. And so what would happen is as the ships come in, they would hit the post with the mine and it would detonate and it would destroy the ship. So those are the obstacles that were further out. As, as uh, you worked your way inward from the beach, there were several other belts of obstacles like concertina wire across the entire beach mines across the entire beach you've seen those x's uh all over the beach you've seen pictures of that and we'll look at some pictures later across the entire beach so the idea was the first two obstacle belts would take out the ships the last three obstacle belts if a ship landed would slow down or stop the guys that were on the ground so that they couldn't get to the bluffs and it, it worked very well uh Frankly, it was nearly impossible for any of those guys to get through uh, any of those obstacles. And that's why the first folks that landed were the engineers, because as we talked about, one of the engineer's core functions is mobility. And that means whether it be in an open battle type situation, breaching minefields, crossing a river, uh, building bridges, you know, all those sorts of things, that's the job of the engineers. So on D-Day, those first units that landed were front loaded with engineers. Oh, uh, the, ra the range of an 88 is uh, several thousand meters, several thousand meters. So as far out as, as um, I, I, anything on the beach with an 88 from here, you're probably 500 meters from the beach. It's almost too close, you know, which is why they're set back further. Saving Private Ryan, the movie, if you talk to the guys that landed on Omaha Beach, and we'll watch the first scene at some point at the Chateau, but if you talk to the guys that actually landed here, the veterans, they will tell you that that opening scene in Saving Private Ryan was extremely realistic. There's one thing, though, one aspect of it that was completely unrealistic. And you're probably not going to know what it is. But if you watch Saving Private Ryan, all the bunkers are oriented perpendicular to the beach, meaning the bunker is directly facing the water, right? So if you imagine there's an invading force coming this way and you're trying to stop that force and you're firing directly out into the water and let's say that bullet flies out there and misses whatever the target is, what's going to happen? It's going to go in the water, right? But by oriented the bunkers up and down parallel to the beach, which is exactly how this is set up, and you fire a bullet around down the beach, what happens? That thing misses its initial target, it may hit one behind it or behind it or behind it. And so basically by oriented the bunkers parallel to the beach, you create an impenetrable wall of bullets. That's the most effective and most efficient way of ensuring that every single square inch of this beach is covered by fire. That's right. And they were completely interlocking. They were completely interlocking. And so this bunker, again, was housed in 88. Get to the next bunker down. That's more of the machine gun bunker. So... A little bit further back, focus on the boats, focus on the bigger vessels, a little bit closer. Now we're focused on the men and, and the, the guys that are landing. You can see the footprint here of the 88. The base of the 88 went all the way back here. So this entire bunker, and you can see these, um, these old uh, tracks. And so what would happen is the 88 would adjust on these tracks, right, and could adjust fire and move from right to left along these tracks. 
the ammunition was stored back here in these in these um, compartments in the back. And again, these 88 rounds were huge. So constantly, like we talked about, this network of tunnels that they had, they were constantly having to bring up more ammunition, bring up more ammunition. Uh, you can see here that either the British or the United States Navy uh, finally hit their target. And you can see it on the front of the bunker as well. So what, was that a shot? What happened there? Yeah, that was a shell from the Navy. Yeah, the Navy got the Navy, uh, the Navy, the Navy, the Navy, the Navy. So let, let's talk about the timeline a little bit that morning, since we're in here and out of the wind. Um, approximately, the first soldier landed on this beach when we arrived. Uh, the plan was 6.30 in the morning. In reality, it was probably a few minutes past that. But the first soldiers from 1st Infantry Division landed on this beach about 6.30 in the morning. Prior to that, there was a very precise plan to soften the targets on the beach, right? Because we, we obviously we knew where the Germans were at. We had done aerial reconnaissance. We had the French resistance sources. Uh, we had we intercepted uh, radio transmissions through Bletchley Park over in, in in Great Britain, and so we roughly knew where these German fighting positions were at. Uh, on Omaha Beach, we underestimated the size of the force, which you already talked about, but we knew that in order for this to be successful, we had to soften those targets. We had to take out some of these bunkers. We had to give the guys uh, a fighting chance. So there were two primary components uh, of that program. The first component was the Air Force. The second component was the Navy. Okay, Rumstead, uh, Rumstead, again, like we talked about last night, believed that the battle should be fought inland. One of the reasons he believed the battle would be more effective being fought inland is because of the sheer strength of our Navy combined between Britain and the United States. Had the most powerful Navy in the world by a long shot. And he believed that, that, that uh, trying, to stop, trying to stop an evading force of the Allies here on this beach meant that you were going to bear the full brunt of the Navy, which is actually sort of what happened, right? But that was one reason that Runstep believed the battle should be fought in. And so the first part of the program uh, was the Air Force. Second part was the Navy. So the plan was uh, a couple hours before the landings for our, our bombers to fly over from Britain, which was exactly that direction, uh, out towards the water. And the bombers would fly over. They would bomb the hell out of all of these bunkers for two reasons. Number one, hopefully they would hit the bunkers and maybe take some of the Germans out and kill some of the Germans and remove the bunkers. But number two, and even more importantly, they wanted to put bombs on the beaches to one, maybe hit some of the obstacles. And the most, most important thing is to put craters through the beach. So that way, when the guys landed, they had somewhere to go because you, they're completely exposed, as you can see. And so in the hours leading up to D-Day, uh, we did a lot of bombing runs that day in a lot of different parts of the coast because we still wanted to continue to see, deceive the Germans. We didn't want them to know we were landing here, so we didn't just bomb here. We were bombing up and down the coast and up at Calais uh, and all over the place, and basically unimpeded at that point. We had fighters out. We had bombers out, but at that point, we had developed air superiority, so there wasn't much resistance. What was little bit left of the German uh, Luftwaffe at that time, Hitler was actually pulling away from France because he needed to protect the homeland because we were bombing the hell out of the, the German homeland at that point. So it was sort of a perfect storm of events for the Air Force, which basically meant we had complete control of the air. So leading up to the landings, our planes came and we bombed all of these beaches, Utah, Omaha, Gold Sword, Juneau. Uh, Omaha Beach was the least successful uh, of all of those bombing runs. And the reason being, it was directly directly perpendicular to line of approach from the plane. So again, Great Britain in the airfields is that way. The direction of the plane's approach was exactly off the water. So what happens if, if the beach is here, right, and you have planes flying here, they have a millisecond where they have to drop their bomb at exactly the right moment for that bomb to actually hit that beach because they're moving that way, right? So there were ships all over the water at that point 
And so the planes, the bombers, as they flew over, they were nervous that they were going to maybe drop a bomb too early, potentially hit one of our ships. So they held their bombs a split second or a couple seconds too long, and they dropped them. And what happened? The bombs didn't hit the beach. The bombs didn't hit the bunkers. The bombs all landed behind us, probably close to where we parked and further behind that. And nearly every single bomb missed their target. Now, the guys were in, the Germans were here in these bunkers, and they were hearing the bombings and scared shitless, you know. I mean, they're getting bombed. But nearly every single bomb missed the target. So on Omaha Beach specifically, after that entire bombing run, which was like, <laughs> if there's numbers out there, there's like hundreds of thousands of tons of bombs were dropped. Every single one of these bunkers was still intact. And then even if one or two of them happened to get lucky and hit, hit the bunkers, these things were all designed to be able to sustain those bombs. So now the Air Force has done their part, and nothing's different on these beaches. So then here comes the most powerful Navy in the world. And so now the, nav the plan from the Naval standpoint was from like 6 to 6.20 in the morning to just blast this entire, entire wall, right? The entire Atlantic wall. Well, again, the bunkers were designed, oriented up and down the beach, so they didn't have direct. So, you know, you've got the Navy firing in into this, right? So they're well secured, the, the bunkers are well designed. But then again with the Navy, there was a fear that as the soldiers were approaching, that the fire would hit the soldiers on the beach. So that's why the plan was not to assault while the Navy was firing. The plan was for the Navy to fire, stop firing, and then the, the guys would land on the beaches. So here comes the Navy and they, they open up and you've got the battleships that are, you know, five miles off the coast, you've got the destroyers that are three miles off the coast, and they're just blasting the hell uh, out, of, out of the beaches. And yeah, it scared, the Germans were scared shitless, but again, when that naval uh, barrage was complete, these bunkers were all still intact. And so then you've got, bunkers are all still intact, there's no, uh, the obstacles are all still intact because all the bombs missed, there's no craters in the beach, and now the first boat lands uh, at 6.30 or 6.35. And those guys were just flat out sitting ducks. And uh, Higgins boat after Higgins boat landed. Some of them were destroyed. Uh, the 29th Division was down on that side of the beach. The 1st Division was on this side of the beach. And any single one of those veterans that you talk to or meet, 70%, 75%, 80% of their units were, were killed. And uh, the biggest casualties here, right? Yes. This day, this date for the United States military was one of the one of the uh, most deadly days in our military history, including the Civil War, which some brutal battles in the Civil War. But why did the bomb first burn? Why it was just the the flight path. Utah Be just go down the beach. They come in. And well, you had but you had five different beaches. So you had all these planes flying all over the place, and and each uh, set of bombers had their own flight path and. They just assumed we could still hit it, you know. But, for example, Utah Beach is oriented north and south. So as they're flying to Utah Beach from Great Britain, now they're flying parallel to the beach. They hit nearly every one of their targets at Utah Beach, which is one of the reasons that Utah Beach had so, so few casualties compared to Omaha Beach because the planes were coming right down the beach. So, yeah, you miss. You're, you know, you're coming this way. This is the beach. You're coming this way. Bomb, 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 bomb. Yeah, this bomb misses, but it still hits the beach, you know. Yeah. And uh, so that's one of the reasons. And some of the other uh, objectives were sort of like that, where they did have different patterns or flight patterns. But for Omaha Beach specifically, it was just what it was, and they missed. Had to. Yeah, yeah. There, there were just too many planes. Yeah, there, 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 there were too many planes. How many planes were? How many bombers were in the air? I don't know. That's a good question. There were. There were 5,000 ships or thereabouts in the Armada. I don't know how many bombers, you know, thousands probably uh, at different times. But, yeah, there were 5,000 vessels or 200,000 uh, soldiers who were out there on those vessels in that one day. And that's what made it so difficult when the invasion was delayed on June 5th and rescheduled for June 6th. All of that had to be turned around, you know. And uh, we were talking earlier uh, up there. So continuing the timeline, the soldiers landed about 630 and one after the other. It was just because, you know, in the movies, you imagine like you think of like, oh, these boats landed at the same time, these Higgins boats pulling up. 
in reality, that first boat was by themselves, right? It may have been a few seconds, but there was, it was one of those boats, which we think we know who that is, uh, a gentleman by the name of Bill Parker, who, believe it or not, is still alive. Uh, they believe that he was the first man to set foot on, he was an engineer, that he was the first man to set foot on Omaha Beach, or at least in, in his sector. Uh, but at some point, there was one boat that pulls up on this beach. And again, the conditions are very similar to today. So these little Higgins boats are just getting tossed around. The waves are coming in. It's very windy. The guys are getting sick, you know, left and right. I mean, you've read about that and, and how sick they were and, and how miserable they were. And they wanted to die anyway. Like, they just wanted it off that boat, you know. And so as the boats were pulling in, some made it in farther than others. You know, some dropped the ramp. The guys went in and they drowned because they're weighed down with 100 pounds of equipment. They each had uh, about 100 pounds of equipment. Uh, but they carried what was called a May West, which was like a flotation device that was around their midsection. And so what would happen before they jumped, they would pull the May West in case they jumped in, in deep water. But if that thing wasn't positioned exactly right, it would fill up kind of like an airbag in your car and it would just flip them over. And, and they would die. And they would, they would drown. Yep. Other guys, many of the guys that survived, fell in, went underwater. I think you see this a little bit in Saving Private Ryan, and they just ditched all their equipment. They just got rid of it, and, and, and because of that, they were at least able to get. But you think about covering a kilometer of open beach wearing 100 pounds of shit. You know, there's, it's just impossible. And so in one way or another, when they got on the beach, the guys that were able to make it up to the shingle, which we're going to see when we go down on the beach, the shingle, as they call it, was a natural seawall from the tides that came in. You can see it here pretty well. It's pretty much it's similar to how it was uh, on D-Day, when you go down to the more populated areas of Omaha Beach, it's man-made. So they put it in concrete and whatnot. But there was about a four-foot um, wall berm yeah, from the sand and the tides. That was the only cover they had. So their livelihood depending on, on getting to that shingle. Once they got there, that's where the medics were trying to set up and trying to get guys behind the shingle because they at least had some coverage from the, from the machine gun fire. Uh, and that was their mission. But from, uh, from 6.30 in the morning until 8.30 for two hours, Higgins boat after Higgins boat came in and uh, soldier after soldier were killed over and over and over. There was, there was uh, um, 450 heavy bombers, uh, dropped 2,200 tons of bombs. So thank you, Mike. So uh, over and over and over, uh, these Higgins boats pulled up, these guys were killed. There was zero progress to make it off the beach. Uh, and there was a point where the leaders, so you had, I may have talked about this last night, but you had uh, General Montgomery, of course Eisenhower was the Supreme Commander. You had General Montgomery, which is overseeing the, the British and the Canadian beaches, Gold Sword and Juno. And then you had General Bradley overseeing the U.S. beaches. And those guys all had their command ships out in the water, right? They weren't on the beaches. The highest ranking guy in the U.S. beaches was, was Junior. Who's the highest ranking guy on the U.S. beaches at Landon, Jr.? Uh, Roosevelt. That's right. Good job. Yeah. General Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, not the president, Ted, Teddy Roosevelt, but his son. Uh, and he, he was the highest ranking uh, general at Landon, which is another reason that Utah Beach was so successful, because he made some decisions because he was allowed to. He was a general that, that really helped because he was on the ground. But here on Omaha, all of your higher ranking guys were out on these ships and they weren't getting any information. There was, it was so frustrating for everybody. They weren't getting information. They didn't know how the invasion was going. And all of a sudden, around eight o'clock, these reports started coming in that there was zero progress been made. There was no penetration on the beaches. Uh, our guys are dying one after the other after the other. And this mission, this mission is fam about an hour and a half. So about eight o'clock in the morning, six thirty was the landing started, and then about eight o'clock these reports started coming. Nothing positive. It was it was failing. The mission was failing completely, and so Bradley sat down and um, he pulled in uh, Admiral Ramsey, who was his naval commander, uh, and they were talking. And Bradley was very close to pulling the plug uh, on the mission at that point here at Omaha Beach and just withdrawing and, and not landing because we were just, again, one after the other after the other was being killed. 
However, if that happened and he did that, it would put the entire evasion at risk, uh, Operation Overlord. Why? Well, remember when you're invading, you know, if this is the invasion front, you have five, five beaches, right? And you have a force that lands on each beach. Well, initially, each force is independent, meaning their flanks are completely exposed. And so whenever you execute an invasion and you have multiple, you know, landings, the single most important thing is to join forces and join forces quickly and go from having five independent forces to now one consolidated beachhead that can grow together and grow your foothold. Because when you're, when you're parsed like that, you're very vulnerable. So if Omaha Beach, which is the second to last beach objective, if that had failed, then the Utah Beach, which is arguably the most important part of the entire invasion because of Cherbourg and the Cotentin Peninsula and the objectives there, if that had failed, then all the guys at Utah Beach would be completely exposed with no chance of joining up with any of the other forces because there would have been about 24, 25 miles between the guys at Omaha Beach to the British guys over at uh, Gold Beach. So... Failure wasn't really an option either. It wasn't an option to stop. So he, Bradley sat down with, um, with Omar Bradley and said, look, I, I'm, uh, Bradley sat down with Admiral Ramsey and said, uh, we, we got to do something, you know, to help these guys. And so when en what ended up happening around 830 uh, is our Navy ships, um, British, American ships, these destroyers and these battleships pulled in as close as they possibly could to the coast to the point that some of the destroyers touched sand mm -hmm. and they pulled in and there are guys all over, all over the beaches. Soldiers are all over the beaches, right? Trying to get through. And the Navy just started fucking hammering, 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 hammering these bunkers from point blank range, which is why you see things like this and you see these impact rounds. For the Navy, you know, they're used to shooting miles and miles. Yeah, you're staring at you're staring at a gun, and that was enough to knock out several of the bunkers. Uh, it was enough to keep their Germans from firing back because they were now getting hit all around them, and so that was enough to provide some breathing room uh, for the Rangers to penetrate uh, and get into the bluffs further down the beach. Uh, for some of the 29th Division guys to make their way into the bluff and some of the 1st Division guys. And as you'll see in private, Saving Private Ryan, once they made a little bit of penetration into the bluffs, now they started assaulting these bunkers. And these bunkers, these bunkers had light security on the back ends, but once they got up there, then they were able to do what infantry guys do, use your grenades, use your weapons, use those sorts of things. And so around 9.30, 9.45 that morning, uh, there was a bit of penetration, and that was enough uh, to give the guys some breathing room. And then one by one, we started knocking these bunkers out with the infantry guys, that, which then allowed more guys to, to, to land, and then it became sort of a, a landslide, a snowball effect. Yeah, and then by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the beach was uh, mostly secure, mostly secure. And, you know, there were several other uh, reasons on both sides for ultimate success by the Allies and immediate failure by the Allies. You know, there's a school of thought like had all that aspect, but that was carefully considered and the, all, everything was weighed and they decided it was better to, to do it at dawn. Um, on the German side, one of the reasons that, that the entire invasion was successful, there was a huge confusion or mass confusion within the German command structure like we talked about last night. Rommel believed that the focus should be here. Brunstedt believed we should let the Allies land and fight inland, which the Japanese did quite a bit over in, in um, the Pacific. That was sort of their philosophy. At the end of the day, they were complaining to Hitler about who had control of the Panzers. And so finally, Hitler said, I have control of the Panzers. So these Panzers are not going to be deployed unless I okay it. So on D-Day morning, two days before D-Day, the weather was so bad that Rommel, his wife's birthday, 
uh, was on June 5th, I believe. It was either June 5th or June 6th. Uh, a couple days before the invasion, Rommel checked the weather report. And he said, the weather's it's too ugly. The Allies are never going to land in this type of weather. So he left his command post here in France and went home for his wife's birthday in Germany. He was also going home to meet with Hitler himself. He wanted to uh, catch the Fuhrer's ear to talk to him about some of the disagreements that he was having with Rundstedt. So he left. Many of the other officers that weekend, because of the weather, they scheduled like a leadership conference almost uh, that was in Germany to focus on wargaming, what at that time was like wargaming. So many of the other senior German leaders were also gone uh, from the Normandy region. Uh, of course, Calais was still on high alert because that was where everybody thought the invasion was going to be. But the leadership here in Normandy was very thin. Also, the caliber of the soldiers that were here on the German side were not like Germany's finest by any stretch, right? The weapons were here, and they're very powerful and all that. But, you know, Germany was knee-deep in fighting in Russia at that time and had their hands full and was kind of getting beaten at that time. So they did not have their best soldiers here. So you combine that with the fact that the leaders were gone, right? And there was a lot of confusion. So the morning of the invasion, Hitler and the senior leaders, obviously they knew the invasion was happening, but Hitler still believed there was another invasion coming. He believed it was this was not the main invasion. So first of all, he slept in that day, and they didn't want to wake him when they first heard about the invasion. So there was no like immediate response by Hitler at all. But because he believed that there was another invasion coming, he was hesitant and slow to deploy the panzers. And so had the panzers deployed like the moment we landed, there was a good chance they maybe could have pushed us back. But as the day went on and more and more and more soldiers landed and the fighting went inland into the hedgerows and that invasion front started to grow, it was more and more difficult for the panzers to do their thing. On the British side, you know, over at the Orne River, we talked to Mr. Kelly last night, but over at the Orne River and, and over in Caen and that area, that was kind of the main supply line for the Panzers to come and reinforce. And so all those guys did a phenomenal job of securing those bridges like Pegasus Bridge and some of those other objectives over there. And so they prevented, did a great job preventing when the Panzers did finally deploy, they did a great job of controlling the, the flow both. So because all those bridges were wired for explosives, but they didn't want to blow them if they didn't need to because we needed them to get out of here, you know. But if the Panzers were coming and we were getting overrun, then they would have blown the bridges. And those guys did a phenomenal job on that side of the invasion front. Actually, the British side of the invasion front on the airborne uh, op side was much more accurate and fluid than the, the U.S. side, you know. Um, so uh, lots of failures on the German side from a command and control standpoint. Uh, disagreement in their higher command led to delays uh, in deploying reinforcements which allowed our guys time to, to to build the beachhead as i just mentioned when you're combining five different invasion fronts you have to you have to consolidate as quickly as possible the greatest distance between any two of the beaches was between utah beach and omaha beach reason being these cliffs that span miles and miles and miles between the two are completely, you know, unlandable, unless you're the Rangers who... How far from here yeah. to Point Duhok? Uh, from here to Point Duhok, it's a few miles around that bend. Uh, around, see, the, as far out as you can see in the cliffs, Mark, uh, you go around that bend another probably 500 meters or so, and that's Point Duhok. Because remember, Point Duhok, there was what was thought to be a battery uh, on Point Duhok, which was supporting... Germans on both Utah Beach and Omaha Beach. It was almost halfway between the two beaches, so it could hit Omaha Beach and hit Utah Beach. So, um, again, you've got five different invasion fronts. The greatest distance and most difficult uh, two beachheads to combine was the Utah Beach and the Omaha Beach beachheads, right? Because there was such distance, you had the cliffs, you know, all those things. Uh, you look at the little rivers that go inland, and then you look at the supply lines, and you look on a map, and you say, what town are we going to have to take to be able to combine these two invasion forces? And that town ended up being Carenton. So in come the Band of Brothers guys, uh, Easy Company, which is what made Carenton so critical on D-Day, uh, in the days following uh, D-Day. 
to secure that because if we couldn't secure Carenton, we couldn't combine our two forces and truly build the, the beachhead. And so if the Germans were successful in Carenton, they would have severed our Utah Beach Landing Force and our Omaha Beach Landing Force strategically, which I had a map, but strategically uh, for the invasion front, you know, our goal was not just to land. Our goal was to take Europe back, right? So we had to land millions of supplies and equipment. We had to land millions, eventually, of soldiers on this continent to have a force large enough to defeat the German army. So, and this was the start of it right here, right? So we had to, we had to not only land, but we had to build an infrastructure capable of landing all of that stuff here. Every soldier every day consumed about 75 pounds of stuff ammunition, food, water, everything, right? Per day. per day, every single soldier. So you start doing the math on the hundreds of thousands of soldiers and you get into the millions real quick, right? So not only did they have to land, we had to support those guys. So one of the reasons Normandy was chosen is because you had the Cotentin Peninsula, which Utah Beach is at the base of, and then that goes out to Cherbourg, which is major port. So the thought was by landing on these beaches, uh, we're gonna immediately turn the United States beaches, the objectives, the U.S. beaches and objectives are going to immediately turn and move up the Cotentin Peninsula to as quickly as possible take Cherbourg. The Commonwealth forces are going to secure the U.S.'s flank and protect from German counterattack coming across Khan and those places, which they did very effectively. So the plan was not just to land here and sit here. Like, look, we got to land here. we got to move up the peninsula. We need to secure Cherbourg. And oh, by the way, we're, in the meantime, we're going to take these beaches and turn these beaches into mini ports as well, which is where the mulberries came from, you know, the prefabricated ports, basically, that were constructed in, in Britain and towed over and set on these beaches. There's one on Omaha Beach and one on, I forget, Gold Beach, I think, maybe. Uh, and these were literally pre-built massive harbors that were hauled over, towed over, installed, uh, later destroyed uh, in big storm, which you can see these, the normal, this isn't even a storm, this is just normal, these waves. Uh, and so that was the whole question was how can we not only land, but as we move inland, support that effort, number one, and then bring more guys like Third Army, which was waiting in the wings with General Patton. And my dad said when, you, when they landed in July, Eighteen in Utah Beach. I said, what was it like? And he said it was a military port city. He said, I had no idea what things looked like from E Day to his time. He said it was massive. When um, when the guys landed like a month later, uh, and Omaha Beach was used throughout the war. Uh, people landed here even after Cherbourg was in our control. Uh, it was very common for incoming forces from, from Britain to land here on Omaha Beach uh, and, and other beaches. But even a month later, um, there were, there were, uh, it was a logistics uh, maze down on that beach combined with grave sites uh, from soldiers that were buried there, combined with destroyed vehicles all over the place combined with pieces of obstacles that were still laying around, you know, there were minefields that had to be cleared, all that stuff. One of the most important things, uh, does anybody here know what a Bangalore torpedo is? You know what a Bangalore, you guys know what a Bangalore is? So uh, a Bangalore is, Mike, go ahead. You know, I know you know it. It's basically, uh, I'm breaking down layman's terms, strong tube has uh, a fuse in it with, with, with TNT. So the longer you go, you can throw it, it would clean it uh, through the concertina wire. So when it blows, it kind of makes a, a, a narrow lane. Yep. So, so then you can get through. Then they had they had it set up. You'll see it say it right Ryan when they did it, but they had it set up. So they made, made many walkways through the concertina wire to be able to get through. That's how they got through and over the uh, concertina wire. Bangalore, uh, for the, and the engineers typically carried Bangalore torpedoes. and. And they were, like Mike said, almost like poles filled with explosives. And they could also be combined together. So the idea is if you're laying there and you're like under fire, you can take one, assemble it, push it back, put another one on it, push it back. And so you're pushing it into the obstacle belt. And then eventually you arm it, roll over, boom, pull it, blows up. So it's mines, wire, especially wire, 
but things like that, it would blow it, create enough of a lane for the guys to get through. Those were very, very important uh, when the guys are actually able to, 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 to breach the obstacles. And again, I, I was an engineer in the, in the Army, so the engineers are near and dear to my heart. They still use those today. To this day, they still use Bangalore torpedoes. A lot of the stuff, a lot of this technology that was developed during World War II is still, still in use today. Um, but yeah, that was kind of the, the overview of, of the invasion. Next, we'll, we'll go down to the next bunker down, take a look at that, and then we'll go down to the beach, and we'll look at some things down there. You're going to see when you go down to the beach, there's like one rock out there. I know it's windy, so we'll talk in here, but there's like a, looks like a rock down on the beach, and that rock has been there since D-Day. It's not really a rock. What it was was, you know, as all this cement was being poured in here in this concrete to make these bunkers, They'd have this extra cement sometimes. They didn't know where to dump it. So in this case, they just took it and dumped a pile of it down on the beach, uh, which then hardened and became this permanent rock, which has now withstood, withstood 79 years of storms and everything else. But that rock uh, is called Lambert's Rock. It's now been named Lambert's Rock. And it was named after a guy named Ray Lambert, who uh, had, I had the honor of meeting and spending some time with. He passed away last year, the year before. But... Um, he used that rock as a medic to treat the wounded over and over and over again until he was wounded to the point that he could no longer continue. But uh, that rock saved a lot of lives, so they've turned that rock into a memorial for all of the medics. They were part of 1st Division, and one of those medics is Charles Shea, who actually served with uh, Ray Lambert, and you're all going to meet Charles Shea later on uh, in this trip. He's here in Normandy. He's 99, I think, now, and he lives in Normandy permanently. Uh, but he was the one I was telling Peter yes. about that was a Native American. Uh, he lived in, in the United States in a, uh, on a uh, reservation, and small reservation. Penobscot is his, uh, is his uh, tribe, tribal name. Anyway, he lived there. His wife passed away like 30 years ago, so he would come to Normandy for these anniversaries every now and then. And the people he would stay with, the, the ladies finally said, hey, why don't you just move here? And live out the rest of your days here in Normandy. So he did. He moved all of his belongings. They shipped him over. And this lady, uh, Marie, sweet lady, takes care of him. And we become good friends. And she's helped with a lot of the stuff. Uh, she introduced us to Katya originally at the Chateau and all that. But his name is on that rock. When we get down there, you'll, you'll see it on the, on the rock. So any questions so far? I know we've talked about a lot. But eventually, we're going to get down to the bottom, walk around as you see fit. We will, uh, Mike and I will go back up, bring the vehicles down to the beach so we don't have to walk all the way back up. Uh, I know it's chilly out there, so um, stop in the bunkers. Eventually, we'll get the vehicles down there and go in the vehicles. But we do want to talk on the beach about some, about some stuff. And be careful as you're walking down because it's kind of a little steep in places. So just take your time and, and uh, we'll keep going. So we can go this way right out the... Is he really? Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, he's he's a he's a major in, uh, in the Indiana Guard. Where's he stationed at? Which one? Which where? You can cut it, Victor. But he would like. Thank you, thank you for bearing with us for uh, for all that time. I hope I hope you're able to hear everything. W once we get down to the beach here in in the next ten minutes or so, we'll go back live and talk about a few more things. But uh, thanks for tuning in with us so early for all of you that are awake, and we'll see you here in just a bit.